the first night of our retreat, and they were doing some team building activities while we're cleaning up. Should be an exciting weekend. Well, we've got a mixture of staff and key leaders, volunteers, all up here for a few days, just uh, enjoying God's presence and trying to get direction for uh, what he has for our church. You know, you really don't know people until you sit down and have a meal with them. And here we are at Camp Hope having our lunch. And in the same way, I'm inviting you guys to come to our next Gateway class next Sunday, the 23rd, after 11 o'clock service and have lunch with me. I'd love to share with you the vision of our church, the values of the vineyard, and where we're going together. So come with us to Gateway next Sunday after 11 o'clock service. It'll be a great time, and I'm looking forward to meet you guys. Can you imagine yourself sitting down and having dinner with a bunch of vineyard people? Well, we have this amazing thing coming up in a few weeks. It's called Alpha. But we just get together, we eat a dinner, and for you who are exploring some of the things about Christ, come and join us. You'll learn a lot about Jesus during this time and meet some new friends. Like my friend Dale. <laughs> Hi, Dale. Well, that's a good one for this day. All right, for those who have taken Alpha, those who are new believers in Christ Jesus, those who are looking to connect here at Canyon View, uh, we have a new 12-week seminar called Foundations. It's an opportunity for you to understand the basics of Christianity. It's an opportunity for you to discover your spiritual gifts, and it's a chance to learn how to live out your God-given calling or purpose. It's coming up Wednesday nights this fall here at church. Come and find out more information at the group's ministry desk and come join the adventure. I'm sitting here with my good buddy, Glenn Brown. How you doing, Glenn? I'm good, great. <laughs> this weekend, I'm actually going to be going to Canyon City because they're having the grand opening of, of their new building that they just completed that Jane and I actually helped get started uh, three years ago when we were there. And so I'll be in Canyon City this weekend, and Glenn is going to be sharing with you guys this weekend. So you guys will be incredibly blessed when you hear uh, Glenn's message that he has. Are you going to talk about anything? I'm going to talk, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to talk about overcoming fear. Overcoming fear. So God bless you guys as you overcome the fears of your life. I was going to preach about overcoming fear this weekend, and um, I woke up at 3 o'clock this morning, haven't been back to sleep, and I've had so much anxiety that I'm jumping up and down inside, so <laughs> I think that disqualifies me from preaching this message, so um, I appreciate it if you'd pray for me and, and with me, because I think God wants to speak to us tonight. Let's pray. We need you, Lord. We need you. Come and speak to us. Come and help us. We pray in Jesus' name. The list of things that people fear is almost endless. Here are a few things. Fear of rejection, fear of things, places, flying, snakes, spiders, the dark, the future, authority, men, women, speaking in public, being alone, death, 
disapproval, pain, noises, germs, water, fire, insanity, poverty, making decisions, driving, confrontation, failure, and on and on. I was listening to NPR on my car radio this week, and a man who circulates in the business community said he's never seen such a time of fear among business people. They're uneasy. They're, they're fearful. They're not sure if credit's going to be available. They're, they're not sure if consumers are going to start buying again. They're not sure about what the government's going to do. And then they interviewed a, a recent graduate from university, and he said, kids in university are fearful. They're, they're, they're not sure if jobs are going to be there, and they're overwhelmed with student loans and so forth. This is a time of anxiety. And 1 John 4.18 tells us, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has torment. I looked up torment in the dictionary. It's very interesting. Number one, you know, they have the, the different meanings. Number one was an instrument of torture, and it mentioned the rack that terrible device they used in the Middle Ages to stretch people out and break their joints. It's an instrument of torture. That's what torment means. Number two, great pain or anguish, physical or mental suffering and agony. Number three, harassment, persecution. Fear has torment. It has suffering, agony, persecution. Have you ever laid in bed unable to sleep and your mind was playing over and over your doctor's diagnosis? Or perhaps something has been feeling wrong in your body and you're afraid to go see the doctor? Or possibly your job situation? What are we going to do? Or possibly the situation of one of your children. You're worried sick. And you can't do anything. Worry, anxiety, and stress are part of a package labeled fear. And it's tormenting. Many recent medical reports indicate that stress, which is a consequence of fear and worry, may be behind as much as 80% 80, 80 of all sickness. I, I've read this in a number of different uh, statements and, and uh, uh, teachings by doctors. Fear has torment. It makes people sick. And if perfect love casts out fear, many of us would have to admit we're not there yet. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Look, look at that verse. God has not, God, let me emphasize the word God. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. So note first that fear is not from God. And number two, it refers to a spirit of fear. Sometimes fear is not just an emotion, it's a spirit. Sometimes the spirit of fear comes through generations. I think of a lady I prayed with some time back, and this has happened many times, and she told me that she had been tormented all of her life. This was a lady up in years. And she said that also her mother and her grandmother were tormented all their lives by fear. So obviously this was a generational spirit. My mother was a very fearful person, and I I learned late in life, actually God revealed it to me because no one there in my family ever, ever mentioned it. But I, I believe I truly heard from God and he, he told me that, that the reason my mother and her sisters acted the way they did, it was a very messed up family, is that they had, all the, all the girls had been abused by their father. Uh, I never met my grandfather, he died before I was born. But my mother was fearful all of her life. And she suffered with what she called neuritis. 
and she always rubbed a, a, a spot on her left upper back and said her neuritis was aching. Now, my father was a strong and courageous man, and he wanted me to be like him. And I desperately wanted to be like him. But unfortunately, I was like my mother. I inherited her temperament, including the fact that I was very fearful. And as I grew into adulthood, a spot on my left upper back ached. And many times I could feel fear emanating from that spot. And I didn't understand that at all. And when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in, in January of 1973, I started studying about the demonic. And I learned about generational curses and generational spirits. Bingo, the light came on. I forgave my grandfather for his terrible sin. I took authority over that spirit of fear and commanded it to go. I specifically broke the demonic power center, which is what I assume it was, on my left upper back. And that spot was healed or the power was broken. I don't know how to say it. I don't know exactly what happened, but it was gone. And that experience greatly helped me in my lifetime struggle against fear. Sometimes fear turns into panic when people are absolutely out of control. I looked up the word panic in the dictionary. It comes from the word pan, which was that Greek and Roman god. They both worshiped that god. You've seen it. The picture of a person with the body of a goat and the torso of a man who has pointed ears and horns, that's Pan. That's a demon spirit. Panic is demonic. We have authority over spirits. When we identify them, we can command them to go in the name of Jesus and they have to go. Praise the Lord. And if you're interested in more on this subject, I have uh, bottom of your footnotes there. You can look up my teachings. I have a website that John James graciously pre prepared for me. And one of the chapters, uh, number five, is on generational curses. And number eight is on the wounds of, of trauma. So you might want to look that up. I'm, I'm glad to provide that for you out of my generosity. But... <laughs> If you wouldn't mind sending me $50 when you click on it, <laughs> um, I'll soon be very rich. <laughs> and I might do a commercial. We're also having an ongoing uh, class down at the chapel on inner healing and deliverance and some other stuff. We're talking about all kinds of things, and we're having so much fun. We're going to extend it a while, so maybe five or ten weeks or till Christmas or whatever. So uh, and anyway... You're welcome. We're welcome to come and drop in and any time. Another way to think about fear. Fear is a normal human emotion. It's a good thing. It's, it's necessary to protect us. We teach our little ones, don't, don't run in the street. Don't play with matches. But it's easy for fear and anxiety to, to get out of control and become tormenting. And every new experience of life is fearful. Starting to school. It, do you remember when you started the school? I, that's one of the memories I have. I can remember walking down the sidewalk and my mother leaving me and turning back home. And I said, Mommy, I don't want to do this. I still do that frequently. But <laughs> <laughs> Graduating is a fearful time. Changing jobs is fearful. Getting married is fearful. Having children. The call of God is fearful. Every step of it. Because we have an enemy who tries to put fear into us and all kinds of discouragement. Attending church is a big deal for some people. I, when I was a pastor, I remember one couple that, that were planning to come to church. I ran into the guy and he said, 
you know, Brother Glenn, I had the most uh, strange thing happen last Sunday. We really were, were going to come to church, and we got up in the morning, and one of my children started vomiting. And then in, my wife and I got in a real terrible argument, and then I went outside, and I had a flat tire. What's going on? Well, attending church is dangerous. You might catch something, <laughs> right? Like, like Ronnie was talking about. Tithing is scary for a lot of people. I, I mean, yeah, we say we believe in God, but boy, it's hard not to just trust in money. To, to take that step, it's scary for people. Praying for the sick is scary for people. Making a deeper commitment to Christ at whatever level we're on. We're, we're afraid of the opinion of, of friends and family. The Bible calls that fear of man. What will they think? When you decide to commit your job or your, your business or your career to Christ, what does that mean? Well, God has a strategy for us on our jobs. I mean, if we just do our Christianity in church, it's, it's a mighty thin uh, thing, isn't it? So, but how do we do that? How do we, how do we, it doesn't mean carrying a big Bible and grabbing everybody and saying, are you saved, brother? That. That, that's not too great. But God has a strategy for us to turn our work into a place of discipleship. When you, when you step out in the life of the church to use your talents in the area of music or, or teaching or small group leader or whatever it might be, that, that is fearful. When you decide, I mean, Pastor Kirk has been, been promoting adopting a child in, in, in Haiti or some other place and, or, or being a foster parent, a parent. My goodness, talk about fearful. Wow, how I admire the people who, you know, this is not for everybody. It's certainly not for me. <laughs> Boy, thank God I'm too old for that program. <laughs> I have four kids, and I love them like more than I love breath, but I don't want any more. <laughs> <laughs> I can't stand any more blessings. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Going into the ministry, and of course, you know, that's a misnomer. We're all in ministry, but a few of us are called into pastoral ministry. That's a scary time. Doris and I, we were we were past young people age. I was 35, and she was about 32, and we had four children when I left the business world and started to, to seminary in the Methodist Church. That was scary, especially for her. Going on short-term mission trips. You know, I, gosh, I, I wish that everyone would do that. It's just great. I've told one time before about what a struggle it was for me to start going into prison ministry. But what a, what a blessing. How I love it. There are many guys in our church in, in Kairos and in other prison ministries, in jail ministry. It was a struggle for me when I started going to the Amazon, and um, I met a new girlfriend down there. Her name's Anna. Would you show her a picture it's that picture of the Amazon. <laughs> there it is. That's Anaconda. <laughs> Thank you. She can really hug, let me tell you. <laughs> let, let me tell you why I did that. I was trapped. There was a team of preachers and some other people. We went to this petting zoo uh, in Peru. And um, some of the guys started, it took two or three guys to pick up that doggone snake. And I said, man, no way. And then this crazy woman on our team, she ran up there and said, put it on my neck. And they took pictures. And I said, man, now I'm going to have to do it or I look like a chicken. <laughs> that, that's true. That, that's <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad. It wasn't that bad. Let's expand our horizon and talk about the world. The world is a dangerous place, as if you didn't know. 
The news media feeds us a regular diet of war and crime and terrorism and airliner crashes, and, and then they delight to give us special reports about the inevitability of natural disasters. And they always say, it's not a matter of if, but when. The big one is going to hit California any time now, and it's not a matter of if, but when. A massive meteor the size of Kansas is going to hit our country. There it is. It's like the one that killed the dinosaurs. But you know, Revelation 8.10 says that a burning star fell from heaven and caused massive destruction. I, I think it's probably not a matter of if, but when. And Christian prophets are making some fearsome predictions. John Paul Jackson, Jackson just two, two weeks ago, he was on Sid Roth's program. And he's a man I, I respect. He has a proven track record. And he had a, he had a uh, revelation, a, 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 a word from God, a prophetic vision. And this is what he said. It, he says, God is showing me that a perfect storm is coming to the world involving war and terrorism and economic collapse and religion and natural disasters. And secular prophets are saying the same thing. The reality is we know that something has changed in the world. It's different than it used to be, isn't it? You have to be blind not to see it. I believe we are in the end times. I don't know where we are on the, on the progression of it, but it's prophesied in the Bible. And I believe that great disasters are coming on the earth. Jesus said that in these times, men's hearts will melt with fear. And we've already seen 9-11 and Hurricane Katrina and the, the economic collapse of the last two years. Now, the good news is that we were born for such a time as this. God has entrusted this time to you and me. Multitudes, if we're in that time, will fall into total fear and, and a struggle for self-preservation and savagery. Multitudes will also run to Christ as a refuge. They have no other place to go. What an opportunity for us. We need to be prepared. Now let's pull back and take a deep breath, as John Jessup says, and think about the encouragement and the exhortation that, and the instruction that the Bible gives us. Fear is a normal human emotion. So how can we not become fearful for ourselves and for our loved ones? The Bible has some very strange advice for us. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 says, since Christ has promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Stop and reread that verse and think about it. You're an average person, even a genius type person, would never come up with that advice. God is telling us that because our Lord, our Savior, our Christ has promised to always be with us, He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We can decide on the basis of that promise. We can choose not to fear. We can say it. See, it, it, it says we may boldly say, not just think it, declare it. Because there's something powerful about speaking God's truths. We can say in whatever time of fear comes to our lives, I will not fear for the Lord is with me. He's my helper. Because what can man do to me? What, what can bad men or bad circumstances do to me? They can hurt us physically. They can kill us physically. But so what? What? These bodies are wearing out anyway. They're just a tent, as Simon Peter reminds us. They're built for temporary occupancy. 
Easy for me to say, you might say, since my tent is about worn out. <laughs> but we have a house not made with hands that's been prepared for us. And in the meantime, our Lord has promised that He is with us every step of the way. Now let's get really practical. This is the core of my teaching. The Bible never tells us not to feel fear. It tells us not to fear. The Bible definition of fear means to yield to it, to run away, to hide, to quit, to stop, to give up. Fear, according to the Bible, means basically flight, to run from. The Bible does not say shake not, sweat not, tremble not, but fear not. In Deuteronomy 31, Moses commissions Joshua to take over the enormous responsibility of governing Israel. And in verse 6, can you put up that, those next scriptures? I, I asked Charity, our media person, to find me a photograph of the wall of Jericho, but I don't think that's it. Verse 6, 6 says, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear or be afraid of the Canaanites, for the Lord your God is going with you. Do you see the pattern? Don't be afraid. God's going to be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Verse 7 says that this is just a part of those verses. Be strong and of good courage. Verse 8 says, God will be with you. Don't fear or be dismayed. And then after Moses' death, God speaks directly to Joshua. And this is a part of what God tells him in the first chapter of Joshua. Verse 6, be strong and of good courage. Verse 7, only be strong and very courageous. Verse 9, I command you, be strong and of good courage. Don't be afraid or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Why is God repeating himself and telling, God, uh, telling Joshua time after time not to be afraid? Because Joshua is going into a terribly fearful situation where Israel will face overwhelming enemies that can easily kill everybody. Let's have that clip of, of Braveheart. scares you just to look at it, doesn't it? This is what Joshua and his legions were going to face. This was the British army, a disciplined, powerful, well-equipped, experienced, battle-tested army against a mob of people defending their land. And that's a picture of of Israel, it, it was just a, just a group of people that had come out of the wilderness. And they were going to face these massive armies. There was no way they could win in the natural. And God is telling Joshua not to feel fear because Joshua is going to be afraid. His people are going to be afraid. And so God commands him time and again, don't be afraid. That is, even though you feel fear... Don't run away. Face your enemies.